thing when you can just post one comment per hour, don't be worried. It's a measurement on Drupal.org to avoid spam. So yeah, it, it, the system automatically detects if your account is older, then you will have no problem. I don't know, so you can't, if you try to post many comments within one minute, like you're looking like a bot, then Drupal.org will, I'm not sure how it works. There's some spammer role that you then get or that you lose at some point. It's, I'm not sure how it works exactly. It's a bit of a secret, so that spammers don't know how it works on Drupal.org, but yeah. Of course, Drupal.org is a popular website, so people want to publish their content there because it's good for their SEO ranking or whatever. Which also means anything that you do for your uh, Drupal company on Drupal.org gives your company and yourself more visibility. So really, the first thing when you start out with Drupal is just create an account and yeah, it's the first step. So this session will also be a little bit developer centric. So yeah, I will show you the, the tools that you need as a developer to get something up and running on Drupal.org. Hmm? Maybe in two minutes. We have to wait a bit uh, until the people arrive and until the recording is ready. Are we ready for recording? So we wait two more minutes to let some more people in and then I'm going to start. If you have any questions at any point, just feel free to ask me. Just, just raise your hand and I'm going to repeat the question to the microphone so that it's in the recording. We also have some microphones here, checking if they work. Do you have a question, sir? What's the best so far with Mumbai? Uh, I think the food. So food is good. I'm a vegetarian. So I live in Austria and the options there are limited. So it's nice to go to an Asian place because they have lots of veggie food. I like that. Okay, I think I'm going to start now so that we don't lose a lot of time. Hello everybody, welcome to my session. This will be about publishing a module on Drupal.org. So I'm assuming you're a, de you're a developer and you have some kind of code and you want to start to contribute, you want to share something with the community. Um, my name is Klaus Burer or Klausi on Drupal.org. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Epico. It's a small company in Austria, in Europe. Um, we're working on job boards, which means we're using Drupal and sell them as uh, job boards where companies can post their company profiles and post jobs and applicants can apply for jobs. That's basically our business. On Drupal.org I'm a project application review administrator which means um, there's a group of people that look at new contributors, what kind of code they provide and we review that code. I'm also a member of the Drupal security team so when security releases come out we coordinate with the, all the maintainers on Drupal.org um, to get that out. I'm currently working on the rules project. This is a contributed module for Drupal 8. And I'm also a maintainer of the REST module uh, in Drupal 8 core. And then I also work on coding standards for Drupal. So there's the coder project, which can automatically review your code for coding standards errors. I will also talk about that a little bit later. Uh, so much about me. So one important aspect um, I want to talk a little bit about is uh, contribution. So we should all thank each other more that we contribute much, that we offer our code to be shared amongst each other because uh, no one person alone could um, 
program all the code that has been developed for Drupal on their own. So we all live off each other's contributions. So this is the most important aspect of the Drupal community is that we all provide contributions and this makes this huge pile of magic where you can build actual websites and get stuff done. So I also want to thank you to you all for your future contributions. This is important for the Drupal community, as I said, and this is uh, always the thing that we should focus on when we work together, that we appreciate uh, each other's contribution and that we make them useful and that we make the most out of it. Um, so before you start to publish a module, there are some questions that you should ask yourself. Um, one aspect is um, duplication. Most of the time when you want to publish code, there is something similar probably already out there. So. The first thing in order is to do a web search. Do a Google search or do a, a search on drupal.org. Does a, a module like that already exist? Can I work with the maintainers that are already there? Can I contribute my code there? Because if we create many similar modules on drupal.org, uh, then it means that it's much, much harder for the users, and we all are users, I'm also searching for modules on drupal.org to find the right thing. If there are 10 modules doing the same thing and they only have one maintainer and they're not working together, then that's really bad because I have no idea which module I should choose. So this plays into the, the, the Drupal community ethos of joint forces, which means we always emphasize collaboration over competition. Um, in this community, you are not alone. There are always like-minded people, people trying to accomplish the same task. So you should really work together instead of competing and then make one module which is better than two separate modules that do kind of the same things but are not really finished. So it's always better to combine that force. Then there's also the aspect of utility. So when you program a custom module for your site, it might be very specific to that use case of a site. Then that means it might not be that useful if you publish it as a project on, on Drupal.org because it should be in some way generic that you could use it on any Drupal site for a certain use case. For example, if you have the organic groups module, it's quite generic. It doesn't tell you that this is made for a news site or this is made for a job board site. It's just grouping content together and providing a use case. That's also uh, uh, an important aspect of the Drupal community that every module is programmed in a very flexible way and can be used for many things. And also there's the aspect of dedication. It should be Publishing a module is not a one-off shot that you just do once and then forget about it. You should also think about how am I going to maintain this? How, what happens if there's a security issue? Then you have to work together with the security team to create a new release. So you should also think about how you can support this in the long term, be a responsible maintainer. <clears throat> so the first thing that we have in Drupal.org are so-called sandboxes. These are project pages that have um, a sandbox URL. So it clearly st says in the, in the URL that this is a sandbox from the user Klausi, and it has just a number. And it also has this experimental warning, meaning that um, there is code in there that hasn't been reviewed, that hasn't been tested. It's probably not meant for production use. It's just something a person put out there. And the most important aspect is everybody that has a Drupal.org account and has agreed to the terms and conditions, and I think there's also a, a Git um, repository policy um, can create such a sandbox. So you create your account in Drupal.org and this is where you start. With a sandbox everybody can, can push their code. The only thing you need to know is Git. I will talk a little bit about that later. So a sandbox has this project page and it also has a Git repository and the Git repository contains the actual code. And the project page is, is meant to describe the, the sandbox, what kind of code is in there. As we can see there are no releases. Releases are only for full projects and that's basically all there is to a sandbox. On the other hand, there's another kind of project on Drupal.org. These are called full projects. So what you can see here, they have a full namespaced URL, which means they always have the slash project prefix and then a short name for the project. In rules, it's just rules, something, there's an underscore in there. You probably have seen this pattern a lot. And the biggest differences to sandboxes is, of course, they don't have an experimental warning and they have tag releases. So you have some branches in Git and then you create tags and can make releases out of them. And all projects on Drupal.org that have stable releases like that, they are also supported by the Drupal security team. So when a security issue comes up, the security team works together with the maintainers to get a new release out and create a so-called security advisory uh, telling people that they should update and what the problem was and how it was fixed. So that's the biggest uh, thing. Not everybody can create full projects. This is uh, only user accounts that have been reviewed can do this and I will talk about this uh, review process. But there's also the um, possibility of abandoned projects. So there are quite a lot, quite a few, a lot, I don't know how to, to say that correctly. There are some unmaintained projects uh, on Drupal.org. 
So in, as I already said in the beginning when I talked about duplication, instead of publishing something new or instead of publishing a fork, um, you should work together with uh, the unmaintained projects. You just contact the maintainer and if they don't respond, uh, then you just open an issue in the Drupal.org webmaster queue and you say, hey, I would like to take over this project. Here is some code that I've written. This should be replaced. And then the webmasters will, give, will transfer the ownership of this full project to you. So you can now work in this project. And people should do that more often. They should work together. Sometimes the maintainers just say, yeah, sure, you can work with a project. It's not a problem. And we should do this more often. So instead of creating another project, um, really do that. For example, you shouldn't create this plus project or a better project. Don't create projects like better comments or coda plus or I don't know, comments double plus improved now really. You shouldn't really do that. Work together with the projects that already exist and improve them. Also, there are existing users of this full project. So when there is new code out there, they are going to test it and they will give you feedback. You have a much higher visibility to do that. As I already said, you if you cannot contact the maintainer, if they don't respond, you can go to the webmasters and they will transfer the ownership to you. So there's a link in there where you can get the instructions exactly how to do that. And these slides are also up at the DrupalCon website now, so you can open the presentation from the website and click through the slides and then you can click on the links if you want to look this up. As I already mentioned, every sandbox, every full project has a Git repository attached to it. So for every Drupal developer, it's very important to learn the basics in Git because every maintainer, everybody that pushes code to Drupal.org has to know Git to some degree. You can either use Git from the command line, you can use it uh, in your IDE, for example, in PHP Storm or in NetBeans, you just use it somehow. And why do we use Git? It tracks the changes that you make to your project. So you make an, an amount of so-called commits, which means that are change sets to your code, and then you tag a release at a certain point. And later you find a bug, you fix that, and you might f fix another bug, and then you create a new tag, and this is then going to be the next release. Every project on Drupal.org has a version control tab, and there you can find the git clone command. It's actually very similar to other systems like GitHub that you know. Every project page that you see has an associated git uh, repository, and you find a clone command there, and how you give you the instruction how to get the code. Branch names in Drupal, we usually uh, call after the, the major version of Drupal that it's, the code is written against. So this would be an example for a Drupal 8 code. You call it 8.x minus the branch of the project 1.x. And the tag would then look like this. Um, my module is somehow ready, so I tag it with uh, 8.x 1.0, but it's the first beta, it's not a full release yet. And the documentation how to use Git is actually quite good on Drupal.org. I also recommend you to look up that. It's an essential tool that you should use for the project that you publish on Drupal.org, but it's also nice to use Git for your client projects. It's really an essential tool for any Drupal developer. Uh, another thing that you consider before you publish your module is to follow the coding standards. This is important because other people are going to look at your code, contributors, clients, people that want to do a security review of a code. Um, they want to look at it because Drupal is of course open source, so people are going to read your code and they need to understand it. This is why I have come together to set uh, a, certain, um, um, a certain set of standards and formalities. So for example, around white space and indentation, how code should look like. Because if we all use the same patterns for our code, then it's much easier to look at another module and then uh, immediately realizing what is going on there and um, what the module does. There are also naming conventions, how you should name your functions. For example, in Drupal, every a uh, function that you write for a Drupal 7 module, for example, needs to start with your module name. That's why, for example, in the rules module, every function will start with uh, rules lowercase. So these are some conventions that we follow. Uh, we also have lots of, uh, lo lots of coding standards for inline documentation. So when you write code, you should leave comments. You should uh, leave a short comment what a function does. You should give clear names to your variables. And all of this is documented uh, on Drupal.org in the coding standards document. So in order to follow that, there are automated tools that you can use. There is the Coda project, which uses PHP code sniffer. Um, this is a command line tool that you can execute. So what I'm doing here is just invoking the PHP CS command with the Drupal standard on some example module, and then it will list out all the coding standards problems that it finds. For example, there is a function documentation missing or the opening brace is not on a correct line. It will also give you a hint which of those errors it can fix automatically. So Coder and PHP CodeSniffer come with a second command which automatically can fix your coding standards. This is really nice if you have some old legacy code and it's really not written 
it's, it's hard to read because it uses tabs instead of spaces and you can just run this PHP co um, code beautifier over it and it will at least fix that so the code is much more readable. This all lives in the Coda project on Drupal.org so I recommend you to check that out. Uh, the same thing we have for JavaScript. This is done with ESLint. This is a node package. So for most front-end developers it might, it's probably not a problem to install another node uh, package because they're probably using some SAS preprocessing for the CSS anyway. Um, there are instructions how to, to install ESLint and it works pretty much the same in Coder. It will just review your JavaScript file and then give you hints um, uh, what you can improve in your code. Uh, Drupal 8 already ships with such, uh, such an ESLint RC config file which specifies in JavaScript files you should, choose, you should use two space indentation, other stuff that should be done. And on eslint.org you find instructions how to install it and how to run it. So these are essential tools that you can run to automatically check your code. They will give you some, some important hints. And all of this has also been um, put together on a website called pareview.sh. So I wrote the original PA review SH bash script which uses Coder and it uses ESLint and some other review tools that you can execute locally. And then Patrick from Germany put it up on a website called payreview.sh and what you do there, you just um, give it the git repository URL of every project and then hit the submit button and then it will download the module and check it and give you a nice report um, what coding standards problem there are in your project. So in the project application review process, where we look at your code, we use this a lot um, to automatically review code. <clears throat> Another important thing to consider when you publish code on Drupal.org is licensing. So we want to prevent the, the Drupal Association to get into legal trouble. And since Drupal is open source and it's licensed under the GPL version 2, um, all code that is pushed to the Git repositories on Drupal.org is automatically GPL um, version 2. <laughs> Which means um, you need to be careful if you, um, if you have third-party libraries that you're using them in your module because you are not allowed to, to push them in the Git repositories. Instead, you should tell users where to download them. One example, you are using, for example, the Amazon Web Services SDK for PHP in your module. Then don't include it in the Git repository. Just tell users, here's the module, and then you download the Amazon PHP library and put it in this place, and then it will work. So you can also use for Drupal 7 the libraries API module um, to include third-party code. In Drupal 8 it's more and more the, the use of Composer if you're referring to, to um, PHP libraries. Uh, but I think the libraries API still exists for JavaScript libraries that you include in your Drupal code. Yes, so it's also important if you develop a theme, for example, if there are font files or icons, images, make sure that you have the right to publish them on Drupal.org because, as I said, everything that goes in there needs to be GPL version 2, uh, cannot be anything else, and this is important. If it violates the licensing, then you need to remove it. This is also something that we review um, when, we, when we review applicants that apply for full projects. So I think this is the most important aspect when we think about new projects that people put up, uh, security. So of course if you publish a module, it shouldn't make the website it is running on less secure than it was before. So always, when you develop code, always work with it in a security mindset. Make sure that the data is protected, make sure that the configuration that can be done with the module is protected in a way that it cannot be abused or anything else. And Security is also the reason why we don't just allow everybody to publish full projects on Drupal.org because we have the security team and the security team wants to support all stable releases of any contributed module but they can only do that if we know to a certain degree that the people uh, know what they are doing. So we need to check the code somehow, we need to approve users that we trust them and yeah, that's a very important part when we do project application reviews. Um, as I already said, your code that you publish shouldn't be a threat. That's why you should security review the, your own code yourself. But it's also a good idea to, to ask, uh, ask somebody else to do it for you. And in this process you should get a little bit creative. So think about it. How could, who could an attacker abuse your module? What could they do with it? Could they run their own JavaScript? Is there a cross-site scripting vulnerability somewhere? Uh, what weaknesses does your code contain? Is every path that you have implemented protected with a certain permission? Is the code that you have written ready for a production site or is it still very much experimental? Um, and ask yourself also, are you familiar with the security concepts in Drupal? So there are certain vulnerabilities that you can easily run into 
And we have some good documentation on Drupal.org to write secure code. This is mostly written for Drupal 7, but many of the concepts also apply uh, to, to Drupal 8. Um, just to give you an overview, what kind of security vulnerabilities do we find in Drupal Contrib? And more than a half is, is cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And I will talk a little bit about that. It's basically attackers injecting their own JavaScript into your website and thereby they can um, exploit admin access, for example. But there are also other kinds uh, of, of vulnerabilities, like access pipers. You forgot to check for a permission somewhere, or you forgot to protect a path, or you forgot to implement the node access tag when you show a list of nodes. Um, this can easily happen, so there are also quite a few access bypass vulnerabilities. And there are also others, like cross-site request forgery and SQL injection. They make a smaller percentage of the vulnerabilities, but of course they are also very bad. I think that the most, the most that, that has the highest impact is SQL injection. If you have that in a module, it's really bad because then an attacker can easily um, modify data that is in your database, which is yeah really bad. And there are also other kinds of security uh, vulnerabilities in this last piece. So let's look a bit at, at cross-site scripting. What's it, what is this? Um, when you develop a module, um, your module might produce HTML output, and it might access user-provided variables. So in this example, we have a reflected cross-site scripting example. Let's assume you have a simple PHP script, not even Drupal, it's just a simple PHP script, and you're outputting something from the URL, a number. Um, do you think this is secure? What, what could go wrong here? And if you think about it, anything, an attacker can basically pass anything at that number. And when you print it like that, an attacker passes script tags like here, um, they can execute JavaScript on your HTML page. So whenever the page is, is being printed to an administrator, for example, um, then the JavaScript is executed. So what would I do as an attacker? I would send you, you are the admin of the Drupal site, I will send you a, a link with a special number parameter in it. And when you click that link, PHP processes that, prints that out, and then in your browser the script is executed, and that script might, so in this example it just pops up an alert, which is pretty, that's not really harmful, but it could also load some JavaScript code from my homepage, for example, and then execute, execute it as you as the administrator, and for example, create a new user account, or give some other user an, an additional role. So cross-site scripting can be really dangerous, and you should be aware of that. And in Drupal 7, in 7, the general rule is you should always sanitize user-provided text. The user-provided text can come in many forms, as a parameter in the URL, or it can be a node title. It basically can be anything that is in your database. It can be user-provided, so it's not trusted. So when you print something to HTML, we need to make sure that it's not JavaScript that is sanitized properly. In Drupal 8, we use the, the Twig uh, rendering engine, and it has auto-escaping built-in, which is really, really helpful, so I hope that we can bring down the cross-site uh, scripting vulnerabilities for Drupal 8 quite a lot. Yep. But there is also cross-site request forgery. I just show you some vulnerabilities and how they can be exploited, so to give you a feeling what can possibly go wrong with your code. So cross-site request forgery means an attacker can change data without um, verifying the intent. Let's look at this HTML example. So we have an image tag here, and usually you, you would find that the source attribute, you would find some kind of image. So as an attacker, what I have done here, I have put in a URL to your Drupal site in there. Let's say example.com is your Drupal site. And let's say there are a, a quick delete module has been enabled there and it exposes that path. So what happens if you as an admin go there and you have access to the, the quick delete um, path and you go to the attacker's page and the image is rendered? What the browser will do, it will try to fetch this URL and if there is no serious F protection, then Drupal will just execute the code and quickly delete the node in this example. So what we have to do here is either use confirmation forms. The form API in Drupal uh, 7 and 8 and all versions has CSIF protection built in. So that it means when a user goes to that path, they have to click an additional button. So nothing gets deleted by default. Or we you use per user tokens in the URL. So sometimes it's nice to have quick links to delete something, but then we need to do it like this here at the bottom. We have an additional security token. This is different per user, so an attacker cannot guess this token, and uh, the link will be secured and can only be executed from HTML that has been printed for your user and not on some completely different site or whatever. So these are all the things that you have to think about when you uh, take security um, into consideration when publishing your code. And do you see the pattern here? Uh, what happens? We need to be very, very careful about user-provided data that comes into Drupal. It can be in the URL. 
It can mean a request. It can mean a body of the request. It can mean the content of the database. Because as the golden rule in Drupal, you always store um, what the user typed exactly. So if they put in script tags, for example, in the node body, OK, that's fine. You store the script tags in the database in a field. But when you render it to HTML, you make sure that it is then sanitized uh, appropriately. That's why we never trust data that is in the database, because it could be potentially be from someone that we don't trust. And what attackers try to exploit is missing or weak access control. So make sure that your permission setup is um, configured correctly. And what we saw here when I explained to you cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery is that use browser features to perform actions behind the user's back. So when, when we saw the image earlier, the, the browser doesn't ask you, should I fetch this image now? No, it just executes it. It just fetches that path. And if it's an image, then it can, it can display it. But otherwise, it just will execute the request. And whatever happens on that server happens. Same with cross-site scripting. The browser will not ask you, hmm, should I really execute this JavaScript that is here? It looks a bit suspicious. No. The browser, whatever JavaScript tags it finds in the HTML, it will just execute it. And if an attacker manages to inject JavaScript into your HTML, the browser will just execute it. They won't ask for your, for your permission. So that's, that's important that we always keep this, um, everything that is provided by the user, even by admins, by editors, by anybody, is not trusted. And we need to make sure that it's, it's sanitized when we deal with it. OK, now let's talk a little bit about workflow. How does this now work on Drupal.org, the review process? Um, how can you actually put up your code? And there is this review checklist. A lot of these points I have already mentioned. So the review checklist is something that you go through as an applicant, but then also reviewers that look at the code will go through the same things. So they make sure there's no duplication, that the module doesn't exist. They check for security and licensing. Those are the most important parts. But they also take a look, is there documentation? Is it obvious to users how this module can be used? Um, does it follow the coding standards? Is the code usable? How is the API usage? Are they abusing something? Is there maybe an SQL injection or some other weakness that could be exploited. And there's also a link in there which explains that list, which gives you a point for point checklist that you can just go through and make sure that the code follows that. <clears throat> then there is the project application queue. So on Drupal.org, we use the so-called issue queues. Every project has an, an issue queue, like Drupal Core has one, the big modules have one, every module has one. And there's a special project called project applications. So this is not really a project, it's just a meta queue which is used to, to track applicants. So what you do, you go there and you open an issue and you give it the name, the name of the module. For example, uh, I want to publish the rules module. And you apply it for permissions to create full projects with that. Because when you start, your code is in a sandbox and now you want to push it up to a full project to have a nice name and to have releases. So you create your application issue there. It's just a usual issue queue. And then other people will review your, co your code. And in the end, when everything works out, you will get approved. So how is the workflow? You open the application as needs to view, which means somebody else should look at it. And they will then check out the code. They will go through the review checklist that we have seen before. And if they find a, a major problem, for example, um, they find a security issue, they, they tell you, hey, here's a cross-site scripting vulnerability, you should fix that before you publish that, then the, the issue is set to needs work, which means now it's your turn to fix this problem, and when you've done that, you set it back to needs review. So this is the standard issue queue workflow that you might already know from Drupal Core when we develop patches. It's pretty similar, and the same thing we're using here to, to approve applicants, to review them, and then to approve them. And in the end, an, a reviewer says, OK, I don't see any problems anymore with this. Um, then they set it to review and, and test it to the community. So which means, in their opinion, everything is ready. And this can now be approved by a Git admin. And then a Git administrator, this is a group of people on Drupal.org, they <coughs> approve the application and set it to fixed. So what then happens is the user gets the so-called Git vetted user role on Drupal.org. So they have some elevated permissions. And they can now create full projects. They can still create sandboxes, so nothing changes there. But once their sandboxes are ready, they can uh, promote them to full projects. And they cannot only do that for one project, but they can do it for any project in the future. So this is a one-time approval process. You only do this once. You apply with one sandbox. And when that's approved, then we trust you, which means we trust you that all future projects that you create uh, will, be, uh, will be secure and, and good as well. And then you can um, publish them on your own. No review process after that. 
Of course, this is not without problems. So um, there are certain things that are not nice about this review process. If you compare it with GitHub, for example, anybody can, any, can publish anything on GitHub. That's also why you should be really careful if you download something from GitHub because you don't know what are the skills of that person. Did they actually, is this an, a, a known person that, that knows what they are doing or is this just some experimental code? What, yeah, it, it's hard to tell. On Drupal.org, it's more, if it's a full project then a chance that it has been created by a user that knows what they are doing is really high. And if it's a sandbox, then there's a clear distinction, this is experimental. So whatever code you download from Drupal.org, um, you're thinking about, do I need to review this? By how many people is this used? With the most popular modules, like the views module, or uh, I don't know, the rules module, they have been downloaded and used so many times, so the chances are good that this is trusted code. But if you download something which has only one user, you might think about, hmm, maybe I should look at the code myself to make sure it actually does what it says. Yeah, but back to the problems that we have. Uh, one thing is that we're always running out of reviewers. So uh, at some point you might get really angry in the, in the issue queue. You created your application and it takes really a long time. Nobody's looking at your code. Um, some applicants wait even for months and they don't get feedback fast enough. The problem is that we don't have enough reviewers, so this takes some time. These are all volunteers that work in the Drupal community. Nobody get, gets paid for that. And that's why it might take some time. So what other people also might uh, perceive as unfair is this one-time approval process. So once you have the role, um, you don't need to get reviewed again. So people might think this is really unfair. Once the people are approved, they can basically do anything on Drupal.org, but I have to wait here and I cannot publish further modules. So people get really annoyed. Some people are also um, angry that they only get superficial feedback. People are pointing out the coding standards errors they make, but they don't review the actual functionality of the module. So when you provide feedback for a, a, a module, make sure that you point out, yes, this module worked for me. I think this use case should work like this, or this is good. So you should really tell the people about the functionality of the module, not only point out coding standard errors. This is something we have to constantly work on as reviewers so that we give the applicants a good experience when they publish their module. After all, it's a contribution. And as I already said, this is something, th something very valuable. So we should be careful how we treat the applicants. Some consideration, why are we doing this at all? So we could also say, why just can't everybody publish project? Um, but there is the problem of spam. I already mentioned this in the beginning, so there could be some namespace quoting by random users. They sign up for an account, then reserve many uh, namespaces, and then the webmasters have to go in and revert that, give the namespace back. So this could, this could really uh, increase the workload, so that's why we have the process to make this, uh, make this a barrier to spam. But also we have the security team, as I already mentioned, and they want to support all of all contributed modules that are out there, just have a, a stable release. So the security team makes one important distinction. This is between stable releases and non-stable releases. Unstable releases is a beta and alpha version of a module. So the security team does not release advisories for that. But if it's a 1.0 or 1.1 or 2.0, then this is considered to be supported by the security release and they will work together with the maintainers to fix security uh, issues in case they come up. Um, also Drupal has a certain reputation, so most of the code that we have in Drupal.org is actually quite good and most of the contributed modules are also quite good. They are used on many, many sites. This is something to be very proud of of the Drupal community. So of course we want to preserve this, um, this quality level of, of contributed modules. That's also why we consider um, having this process and yeah, and also encourage collaboration over competition. This is falls into the duplication mantra. Don't don't publish your module without checking ever what the community provides. So make sure that you don't duplicate stuff. This these are all reasons why we have the current projects. But yeah, so what can you do to speed up your your application? Our problem is that we are lacking reviewers. So my idea a couple of years ago is that applicants become reviewers themselves. So what you do is you review other applications. So there are there are other applicants out there, they publish interesting modules. You just look at them and you review them according to our checklist and then you say, yes, this module works or no, this module has this and this problem. And after you have done this for three projects, you give your own issue attack PA review review bonus. So which means then you show up on a high priority list where I, for example, as a Git administrator will uh, look first. When, I, when I'm re reviewing applications, I always go to this tag 
because I, I don't have time to review everything, so I need to prioritize, and of course I want to help people that help others, so this is, this is my um, high priority list where I review applications. And it's also a good experience, you can re learn really a lot by reviewing. But you, what you can also do is community networking. So as, as I already said, as community we should work together, so when you when you want to publish code, it's important to make connections to other Drupalistas in your area or worldwide. There are many channels that you can use. You can ask colleagues at your company to review your code. Then you can improve the quality. So you can even work together with them on Drupal.org. You publish the module, your colleague reviews it and sets it to RTBC. This is totally fine. It's just a second pair of eyes that makes sure that the code is good. Or you can it doesn't have to be colleagues, it can be friends, it can be other community members. You can go to local meetups, make connections there, you can go to user groups. But there's also uh, on the internet IRC, we use the internet relay chat protocol, so there are certain um, channels where the Drupal community meets online. You can also go there and try to, to find people that want to work with you. There's also Drupal answers on, on Stack Exchange where um, people ask questions and your module might be the perfect answer to a question, so it also makes sense to post it there. Um, the important thing is just to get visibility to, to your sandbox and then more people will re review it and you will get approved faster. It's also always good to communicate about your, your project, so maybe write a blog post about it, um, post on it on social media, just get the word out so that people know that you are working on this and want to promote this. And it also helps to contribute and make yourself known. So in a, com in a Drupal community you will um, you will, you will just be known and people will trust you, will starting to trust you, will want to work with you. So this is a, a very good process. Everybody should really do community networking because um, we shouldn't work on our own, we should uh, work together. We're all using each other's code, so it's important to work together. What are the benefits of reviewing? So, yeah, you might want to help another applicant, so what, what is in there for you? So what you can really learn, you learn Drupal by reviewing code. You see what other people are doing with Drupal. It's the same as, as if you look into the source code of Drupal Core, you see, ah, it's done like this. This is very interesting. Now I know how it works. The same with other projects. If you review them, you can maybe point out even mistakes. You can say, no, nah, usually in Drupal we do it this way, you did this way, but it has a problem. You learn about alternative ways. People are very creative. So when they publish new modules, they have really interesting idea how they are, are doing things and you can learn really a lot for that. And to learn how to analyze for a code, you learn how to review code, which also comes in handy if you are having a Drupal job and you would like to review code from your, uh, your colleague, then it helps if you are already familiar with that. You also learn how to write secure code because if you look at the ap application list, you will see people pointing out security issues and then as, a, as another reviewer you will see, ah, I haven't thought about that, that's a good point. You learn about best and worst practices, you learn what people do right and what they do wrong and how it could be avoided. So whenever you write the next module, it helps you um, to do it right. You also stay on top of what is new and hot, um, which means there are a lot of interesting new projects uh, posted for certain use cases that are coming up, for web trends for example, any new third party services that might pop up. So a lot of interesting things in the queue, you basically see what, what people are working on. And it also helps your own Drupal career. If you think about it, uh, most of us are professional Drupal developer, but maybe you haven't started with Drupal yet. So this is a, a good um, opportunity to review other people's code, engage with the community, and maybe then land the Drupal job. I always recommend that to people, so um, I'm new to Drupal, I want to work with it, I'm, I don't have a Drupal job yet. This is the perfect opportunity to work uh, with other people and help mentoring and being mentored, and then it's easy to actually get a job in Drupal. <coughs> <clears throat> so how can we improve this on Drupal.org overall? Um, there are some plans that um, people are working on and of course we want to make the experience better for the applicants. So currently they have to wait a lot, it takes time until they, they are reviewed. Um, what can we do about this? Um, the plans are that we automate the, that we integrate the automated reviews into Drupal.org itself. So we saw the PA review website uh, earlier. This is an external site, it's not that nice. It would be actually cool to have a code review tab on every project, on sandboxes and full projects, so that you can go there and see a report. Ah, code has been executed on this, this and this are the problems. I can just um, fix it here. And the plan is also to give every non uh, Git vetted user uh, the rights to promote one sandbox. So, um, 
So you push a code to a sandbox and then you can immediately turn it into a full project, but you can only do that for one sandbox until you're not approved yet. So this is, the goal is to bring people up to speed sooner so that they can get code out sooner with full, uh, with full projects and releases. Although they cannot create stable releases so that they can push out the first beta or the first alpha version of a module and people can already download that and they have the visibility and people know about it and they have a better experience. So there's no, as I already said, there's no security team support for unstable releases. So for the security team, they wouldn't um, be changing much. Um, you would have your beta release out there and then you would go th uh, through the approval process after that. So instead of giving a sandbox for review, you're now giving, um, providing a full project for review and then people will just review that. Otherwise the project, uh, the process stays the same. So you get reviewed once and once you got that, you can publish as many modules as you want. It basically means we trust you now. So there's also an issue to track this on Drupal.org where people are currently working on it. As I said, this is just a plan. It hasn't been implemented yet. So there is a community initiative on Drupal.org to make this happen. And basically we just need to uh, implement certain permissions so that users can publish this one sandbox and then get started sooner. There are a couple of sub-issues in there. So they specifically list what tasks need to be done. And Jeremy Thorson is, is leading that effort. I think he also created that issue. So if you want to help with that, if you are, want to implement something for Drupal.org, that's also the place to get started. Yes, and get involved overall is a good, uh, a good idea anyway. So there's a group of reviewers on groups.drupal.org that do code review in a project applications issue queue. And those are not only Git administrators, but those are regular re reviewers that post the stuff uh, there. One interesting thing that you can also do if you uh, become a little bit experienced in Drupal, you can become a Git admin yourself. So the process is not really difficult. As soon as you are a regular reviewer, we will just get in contact with you. And if, if we see that you do good work, if you bonus points, if you find security issues in, in, in projects on Drupal.org, then we know, ah, this person really knows how to review code. They should be a Git admin themselves and then they can approve users. So this is just a list of people that do that and they always want to put in new um, people. So yeah, just talk to me if you want to get involved with that. Um, as we already talked about the uh, Drupal.org plans, there, is, there are mini tasks now that people can help work on. And there's also another way to get involved that are the code sprints on Sunday. So people will gather and work here at this event at DrupalCon on Drupal Core. They work on contributed projects, they work on documentation, all kinds of things. So you don't just, you don't have to get involved with code reviewing, but there are many, many, many topics in Drupal you can get involved. Um, I'm, I'm active in code review, so I'm also happy to help you out getting involved there. So I think that's it for now. I made it a bit quicker so that we have time for questions. Yes, we have about eight minutes time for questions. Anyone? So here's a microphone. It's, if the question is short, I just repeat it. I was guessing that it's on. I was Just put it closer. I was guessing that uh, uh, can Drupal uh, review process can be used with the help of platform message. With the help of what? Platform. Where black the, form. Platform message. I don't know black form. What's that? Platform. 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 Yeah. Oh, the hosting company. Yeah, it uh, it has a very good uh, review process. Ah, I see. No, I don't know about that. But it would be interesting. So what do they review? Uh, like just like uh, peer reviews, uh -huh. uh, anybody can review any code like that. Uh -huh. So can we implement that? Yeah, I think it's already <laughs> implemented at pareview.sh. And there are now plans to integrate the automated review that Coda does into Drupal.org. So that's one subtask of the plans that I've been talking okay. to do that. Yep. I, I assume that platform.sh does the same thing. I mean, is that uh, PA review compatible with some other repositories as well, or it only works with Git? No, it only works with Git. At this point in time, everybody should be working with Git. Everything else is a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, but I mean, everyone don't use the Git, so that might be the reason. Yes, yes. If you're still using Subversion, for example, or Mercurial or anything else, you should really <laughs> learn Git because it's a tool that is going to be used everywhere on, on Drupal.org and also on other projects. Yep. I, I highly recommend that, so sorry. 
Anyone else? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the metrics like uh, number of uh, installs and downloads. Mm -hmm. uh, at means most of my projects are like long term projects and I usually disable update manager so that uh, this word means the code stays stable. It might break with the new version. So uh, can we it means is there a plan to have a flag or something which I can just go in and say that this pro project works for me because if it is not working I can easily go in and uh, create an issue but if it is working to have a matrix like this is working. No. Nope. It's a good idea. I think people have talked about this uh, very often on Drupal.org that there should be some star rating system or some feedback for users or just a flag um, so that people can indicate this is working for me or not. But currently, no. Currently, you are, it's not implemented yet. I don't know what the current plans for that are. I think it's on hold. Um, so what you can just look at is the amount of installs. Basically, if many people have this module installed, the chances that it's actually working is high. But of course, it always depends on your use case. Yes. Yes. I could have installed the site in five different uh, instances. Yes. Still that data is set. It's still a good indication so because you would have to spin up many many instances to just um, so to create say, false data. Stage, Dave, local instance. There are four instances in a project most of the time, and there is this production. So yes. it becomes five for one install. Yes. Then it will count five times. Instead, it could be like I just give a flag with the uh, project URL, live project URL or project name. Yeah, could be possible. So that becomes more of a better metrics because yes. if I'm trying to enter the site name, there are five developers. They are tr I, uh, trying to enter the site name twice. It says that okay, uh, that project has already been added in the list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, would be an idea. Any more questions? Here's what. Um, this is regarding GitHub. Um, you have Git. Um, can we have the sandbox on GitHub? In GitHub, there is no distinction. Because on GitHub, everything is prefixed with their username or the organization you are working for. So on Drupal.org, it's slash project slash name. On GitHub, it's slash your username or slash organization and then slash the project name. Mm -hmm. So on GitHub, there is no distinction. That's why I said. Be careful with the code from GitHub because you don't know how many people are using that. How secure is this? There is no indication. Mm -hmm. On Drupal.org, you at least know this is in a sandbox, so people mean that this is experimental code. If it's in a full project, the chances that it's actually stable is higher. Okay, the, then there's another question. See, so we want to have two separate things. So is it possible there's a, a way to move code from GitHub to this? Yes. It's, it's totally easy. So what you just do with your, Git, your local Git repository, you just add another remote. You clone from GitHub, then the remote origin is GitHub. Then you can add another remote, you call it Drupal.org, and give it the correct URL. You find it on the version control tab of your project. And then you say git push to the other remote. And then it just pushes all your commits, and then it's just a complete mirror. Of it's the coding. same, it's the mirror of the code in GitHub. Right. So what we do in the rules project, we have a mirror on GitHub, so we're using pull requests to work on rules, right. but the code is also synced to Drupal.org. So, so that's the recommended way. It's some one way to do it. Yeah, so okay. the most important stuff is that the code is on Drupal.org because that's where you create the releases. <laughs> if you have it on GitHub or not, it's your choice. Great. So, so because you know, you'll find a lot of users and developers on GitHub. So if, yes. if, you, if you have an active project, yes. uh, you, you could actually have a, a mirror of it inside uh, the Git of yes. Drupal. Yes. Or would you recommend the other way around, where you have an active project inside? Because the collaboration would happen more freely on GitHub. I, I'm just guessing, you know, probably. It's, it depends. On the, the Drupal community is mostly on Drupal.org, because the issue queue is much better than on GitHub. So in GitHub, you cannot say something to needs work. Only the maintainer of the project can do this, so there's no workflow. If you okay. imagine Drupal Core has 30,000 open issues, right. if you would have done on GitHub, people would go crazy because you can't find anything. On Drupal.org, you have better filters. That's why people use Drupal.org, because the issue queue on GitHub is so limited. Great. Yep. Thanks. So I think we have uh, to stop. Hello. Let me check. Yeah, one more question. Excuse me. I have a question. Uh, I didn't get the point uh, that you have described. Benefit of reviewing, actually. There is a point that uh, learn how to analyze foreign code. Yes. So I didn't get, uh, get this point, actually. Um, it means if you look at other people's code often, it means you develop the skill to analyze foreign code. Foreign means not your own. 
So if you look at another project, it's not your own code, and you do that very often, you see uh, people do it like this, um, that person did it like that, you can compare it in your mind how people do things. So it's uh, the kind of practice you get, and it also helps you with your own programming skills. If you have seen many approaches how people do things, it helps to improve yourself. That's what I meant with that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. I'll be out for more questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you.